Hi and welcome. My name is Marty Shaw and I'm the science teacher here at the Delphine School in Sheridan, Oregon. I've been with the school since 1995, so it's about 25 years. And while we're experts in education, we're brand new at webinars. So bear with us and uh, we'll see if we can learn some things and have fun today. Uh, Remy is my helper. He's the fellow that will be taking your questions and relaying them to me. And he'll be putting up uh, pages from this book. This is Air by Heron Books. Uh, I think you all got or have the ability to get the book and the study guide with it. So hopefully you can follow along. And if you have any questions, there should be a place on your screen that says Q&A. You can click on that and you can ask any questions and Remy will relay those questions to me. Right, Remy? That's right, Marty. Okay. All right. First thing I want to do is talk to you about hand washing. I'm the science teacher here and there's been a lot of talk about washing your hands and how long you should wash your hands and this sort of thing. And so I wanted to speak to you briefly about that before we get into the course. Um, what happens is when you wash your hands, you get rid of any bacteria or viruses that you have on your hands. So here, I have a picture of how soap works. One end that loves water and the other end that loves oil. And so what happens is when you have a virus, this is a picture of a virus. And so part of the virus is a protein and an oil a protein and an oil material. And so just washing your hands with water won't do it. it, won't do anything to these viruses. They'll stay on your hand. However, if you wash for 20 seconds or so vigorously, what happens is the, the part of the water that likes oil will be attracted to the virus and because this is an oil and a protein. And then it'll start eating away at the shell of the virus. That's why you need to wash vigorously. And then the virus will come apart and the water will, and the bubbles will encircle it and wash it away. So remember, when you're washing, you should uh, do it for 20 seconds, wash with soap and water. And you should wash before meals, you should wash after you've gone to the bathroom or anything like that. Okay. Thanks, Marty. Just wanna let everybody know, we will send you those photos at the end of this webinar. So you can see those for yourself up close. Great. So let's take a look at our book, Air. And we're going to do some of the experiments in this book. And then I have a couple of additional extra fun experiments to do. So here's the first page. We have the first page up. Okay. So it says air is all around you. You can feel air moving when you blow on your hand. You can feel air moving when you breathe. When you run, you push air, you push against the air and can feel it. You've all done that, I'm sure. Now, if you've got a, there are a couple of experiments here with straws and you can do those experiments. You can take a straw and blow on someone's hair and see it move. You can get a straw and blow into a glass of water and watch the bubbles. The 
The next page talks about a balloon, a yellow balloon. It just so happens the balloon I picked up was already yellow. Now, if I took a pin, you know what's going to happen, right? So here I'm going to take a push pin and I'm going to put it in here and look at the size of that hole. That's huge. Now, if I took the pin now and put it in, you can't even see that hole that I made. It's really tiny. Why do you suppose the first time I did it, when the balloon was blown up, it made a hole this big? And the second time, it made a balloon out to see it. It's really, really tiny. You can type in your answer on the Q&A or if you'd like, you don't have to. So the next chapter is called Air in Many Places. There is air in soil. Have you noticed after a rainstorm, worms coming up? Why do you suppose that is? Well, what happens is No, they talk. Yeah, here we go. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Earthworms that live in the soil need air. They breathe the air in the little spaces between the soil. So when it rains, these little spaces that have air in it fill up with water. And so the worms have to come up to the top of the, of the soil to breathe. There's air almost everywhere, it says here on page 12. Here's one of the experiments that we do. This is a rock called pumice. Pumice is volcanic. Have you ever gone to the beach and seen like the foam, when the waves push in the foam at the edge of the ocean? Well, this is sort of like the foam of rock from a volcano, and it has air in it, just like the foam at the ocean has air in it. And so even though it's a rock, if I put it in water, it floats because of all the air. Even if I push it under the water, it'll still come back up because of all the air in it. Sponge also has air trapped in it, just like the soil we were reading about. And as a matter of fact, there's air in water, but I'm going to show you this. If I push this in here and squeeze it, you see all those bubbles? Those bubbles were from the air that was trapped in the sponge. Now, yeah. that's what made the bubbles. The next page talks about the air inside your body. So this is a little model that I have. Can you guess what this is a model of? If you guess the lungs, you're right. So here are the lungs and there's a muscle underneath the lungs called the diaphragm. And the diaphragm is what helps us breathe. So when I push down, the balloons or the lungs spill up when I push in, they empty. And so this breathing in and out is caused not by you sucking in air, it's caused by this muscle below your lungs called the diaphragm. And so you breathe in, you exhale, inhale, exhale. I hope you can all see that all right. Marty, we've got a question. <clears throat> Yes. What would you, what's the name of the experiment that we just did? Um, 
Well, the name of the experiment they talked about here, breathing. Every time you breathe, you take air into a part of your lung, a part of your body called the lungs. Your body needs air to breathe. So this is just something I made with a couple of balloons, and this was a plastic glove, uh, and this were, these were, um, this was a two liter soda bottle. And so I have this little space on top, and it's, uh, it's not in the book, but there's a picture of, in the book, of uh, a person breathing and breathing in. And I just wanted to give you a little more information as to how that happened. Okay? All right. It talks about here, mammals like cat, cows, dogs, cats need air. Okay. Now they have some activities to do on page 13. We did the one with pumice. The same thing will happen if you have a container of soil. Uh, if you have a container of soil and you put, uh, and it's pretty packed, and you put water in it, what do you suppose will happen if you fill it water up to the very top? What do you think? Well, what's going to happen is, just like we talked about with the worms, there's air in the soil. And so when you pour the water in, this air, which is lighter than the water, will come up to the top and you'll see bubbles. You could try this at home. Okay. This one's the next chapter is chapter three. It says air takes up space. So here is a little three ounce bathroom cup. Is it empty? Well, yes and no. It has air in it. And then there are some experiments on the next page that we can do. Let's see. I'm going to put this guy over here. Hey, Marty, we've got a question. Yes, Ren. How does air turn into sound? How does air turn into sound? Well, what happens is air, sound is caused by a vibration that is a movement back and forth. And what happens when that happens, the air carries this vibration. It's squeezed and unsqueezed, squeezed and unsqueezed. And that vibration here is carried through the air. Now you could also put your head on the table, your ear on the table, and you can press, you can tap on the table. I'm gonna do that right now. You can hear that sound because the table is vibrating just as the air vibrates. I hope that answered your question. Now, here, I'm going to take this tissue. This is a dry tissue. And I'm going to put it in our empty cup. Now I'm going to take the cup and turn it upside down. And what do you think is going to happen when I put it at the bottom of this beaker? Who thinks the tissue will get wet? Who thinks the tissue won't get wet? Who doesn't know? Okay, we're going to try it. There it is. It's at the very bottom of the, of the beaker. It's totally covered with water. And now if I lift it straight out, it's completely dry because water couldn't get inside because there was air. That's right. 
there was air already in there and that prevented the water from going in. Hey, Marty. <clears throat> yes, Remy. Laura was wondering, why does air float? Air floats because it's lighter than water. Water is a pretty heavy, heavy stuff. And if you ever had to carry gallons of water in from the supermarket, you'll know it's pretty heavy. But when you have an empty gallon container, that's not so heavy. That's pretty light because water is much, much heavier than the air. That's why. I hope that answered your question. Okay. Ah, here's an interesting thing to do. I'm going to take this and put it over here. Now, you'll be able to see this if I just take the empty container, which isn't really empty. It has air in it. And I put it in here. And I turn it. You can see the air coming out. When that happens, the water comes in. And so the air comes out. I'm giving the air a place to escape. So the water comes in and helps push the air out. Okay. Now I'm going to get another balloon and we're going to do another experiment. One of the advantages I have being a science teacher is I get to play with balloons. I have lots of fun. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to make a little loop at the end here. Let me try that again. Okay, that's a better loop. And then I'm going to take some string. And I'm going to put this. Not completely around. Cut it right about there. Now I'm going to take a marker and my head is going right through around the whole balloon and I'm going to make a mark right here. So I made a mark right there where the balloon ends. Now I'm going to take this and I'm going to put it in our freezer. And we'll check on it in a few minutes and see what happens to the size of the balloon. Because air can change. It can get bigger and it can get smaller. This is the experiment that they're talking about on page 20. They want to put it on ice, but I think the, the freezer does a better job. And then they heat it up and you can see it'll change. Okay. So there are a couple of other things that I'd like to do with you now while we're waiting for the balloon in the freezer. We're going to make something called a balloon car. And I just want to show you there are three ways of making a balloon car. This is not something that's in the course. This is extra credit and extra fun. So I have these thin pieces of wood called skewers that I bought. And I can put one through here, through this corrugated cardboard. Corrugated just means it has these wavy lines in the middle. Can you see it? That's corrugated. 
And so I can put one in there and another one in here. Marty, while you're doing that, Ethan had a question. How does air get in things? How does it get in things? Air naturally fills up places. Gases take up space and they naturally fill in places. So if you had a room that didn't have any air and you opened the door, the air would rush in because air likes to spread out. And um, when I, you want to get it into something like a balloon, you have to push against, you have to hold the balloon to your lips or a pump, and you have to push and push that air in there because there's air pushing from the outside, but you need to push harder into the balloon to get the, uh, to make space, make more space for the, uh, for the balloon or whatever it is you do. Now, I have these wheels that I bought. I got them at a place called kelvin.com, K-E-L-V-I-N.com, and they sell these wheels. And uh, these wheels, I don't know if you can see that, spin around very well. If you don't have wheels or um, what you can do is you can get a piece of stiff paper like this, and you could get a cup or a baby food jar and put that here and make a circle and cut around it and make your own wheels. Marty, Laura has a question. She wants to know, is air bigger than an atom? Well, air is made up of atoms. Air is made up mainly of two gases. 99% of the air is made up of a gas called nitrogen, which um, plants use. Plants use them, and once plants use them, uh, that allows people to be able to use them. It's a chemical that people need. And also oxygen. So these two gases, colorless, odorless gases, make up air. So atoms are very, very, very tiny parts of the air. But atoms do make up the air. As a matter of fact, I have a joke for you. So why should you never trust an atom? The answer is because they make up everything. <laughs> Did you get it? Okay. <clears throat> so now what I can do, once you have this cardboard, you can put wheels on it. And what I'm going to do is just put a little tape because if I don't put the tape there, the wheel would fall off. This way, the wheel stays right there. And I'm going to put four wheels on it. Marty? Yes, Remy. On the experiment we did before, how do you get the air, sorry, <clears throat> how do you keep the tissue dry? Or how does air keep the tissue dry when you push the cup into the water? Well, because there's air in here. And remember we talked about how, or talked about in the book, how air takes up space. So all that's in here is the tissue and the air. And so if I put this in here, now if I had a hole in the top, the air would escape out and the water would come in. But because there's no hole in the top, I can put this in here. Now that air, even though the lip of the cup is under the water, there's air in there. And so the water can't get in because the air has no place to go. So that's why the cup comes out a little wet, but the tissue is nice and dry. Did that explain it? If not, just click on Q&A and I'll see if I can try and explain that a little better. I'm putting the last wheel 
on my little balloon car. And now I'm going to get that balloon that we had in the freezer and I'm going to see what it looks like. Here's the balloon right out of the freezer. Whoa. What happened? Can you see? The line was all the way at the bottom, and now the string is all the way here. What happened to the balloon? Well, what happened is when the balloon got cold, the air inside got cold and it shrank. It took up less space. If I take it and I put it in something warm, it would expand and take up more space. Thanks, Marty. Adele wants to know, what is air made of? Well, air is a gas. And it's a combination of gases. The two main gases are and oxygen and uh, the uh, argon and carbon dioxide and other gases make up air. They're all colorless air. That's why you can see things when it's nice and clear. As a matter of fact, I think I have something that will show you that. So this shows you the atmosphere. The atmosphere is the air that surrounds the earth. So all of this, more than three quarters, is made up of this clear gas called nitrogen. And then this part over here is made up of oxygen. That's the stuff we breathe. That's what our bodies need and most animal, all animal bodies need to survive. And then this little itty bitty bit has argon, which is a gas, and other gases like carbon dioxide. But you can see mainly air, the atmosphere is made of these two gases, nitrogen and oxygen. I hope that answered your question. Now, We've got another one. Yes, Ren. How can you store air in a balloon pumper? Well, what happens is balloons, a pumper, when you pull back on the pump, air comes in. But it's sort of a, it's something called a one-way valve. It only lets things in. It only lets the air come in. Because then when I push in on the pump, it pushes it out the nozzle. I think I have a pumper right over here. I have it in the other room. So, but that's what happens. When you pull back, air comes in. When you push in on the pump, the air can only go one way. It can't go out. It has a one, pumps have a one-way valve, okay? Well, I have a lot of things to do here, and so I want to see if I can speed up on these things to show you some fun things. Um, let's see. So I just cut the end off of this, and now I'm going to attach part of it. I cut a little bit of the straw. So this is something you could do at home. And I'm just gonna fold this over like that and take some tape. I'm 
And I'm going to see if I can seal that end. Do it again over here. And now we can just take our tape and tie it down here. And now this is what I have. Whoop, I forgot to put tape on there. There we go. So there are lots of different ways to do this. This is just one way. And this is just gonna show you how air can move things. So I can take this straw and blow into it. And if I put it here, when I let go, what do you suppose the air is going to do? The air is going to go out the straw, and then it's going to make the balloon car needed a little help to get it started. Go that away. If you blow it up more, it will make it go a little faster. There are a couple of different ways to do this. Another way is to get a longer piece of cardboard like this and fold it over. And I'll just use a little bit of tape to hold that fold. And now I can put wheels here and at the very front and take a scissor or any sharp object. Be careful with this. And now I don't have to cut the end off. I could just sort of push it through. Like so, and blow into it. Now, of course, this isn't going to go anywhere because we don't have wheels on it. But I just wanted to show you how this works because when I do let it go, it'll move and the air will go out this way and it'll push the car. Sorry to interrupt, Marty, but Laura was wondering, could you tell us quickly how the balloon shrank in one of the last experiments you did? Sure. Well, When it gets cold, air shrinks down and takes up less space. It's just as simple as that. If I took that balloon and I warmed it up, it would get bigger. Air doesn't always take up the same amount of space. They talk about this in your book. Air is wind. Air pushes. Well, let's see. I'll look at the very front of the book where there's an index. Air pushes, pinwheel activities, activities. I'm not exactly sure where it is, but air takes up space. And so that space isn't always the same. And so if you have, if the temperature is warm, the air expands and gets bigger. And if the temperature is cold, the air shrinks down. Okay. Let's see. Ah, so this is one of the experiments that they do have, I believe in the book, where I have a Snapple bottle, a glass bottle, and I put a balloon over it. Now, if I take this and put this in hot water, what do you think will happen? Well, I'm gonna ask one of my assistants to get a container with hot water in it. And 
you could get a large beaker and put it in, well, we'll put it in a microwave. That'll heat it up. <clears throat> Can you answer a question quickly, Marty? Sure. <clears throat> There's a couple good ones here, actually. So, yeah. Does air have a lot of weight? Well, air is pretty light stuff. But, you know, it goes up in the atmosphere for miles. And so when you consider all of that air weighing down, being attracted to the earth by gravity, it, it weighs quite a bit. It weighs about 14 and a half pounds for every square inch. So that much uh, space, the air from all the way up to the top of the atmosphere down to here is pushing down with 14 and a half pounds of pressure. We don't really feel it because we're used to it, but it, it's light, but there's so much of it that it does weigh a lot. Is there yes. another question, Remy? Yeah. Why do we need air to survive? Well, air is made up, as I showed you, of oxygen. And oxygen is what our bodies need to change the food we eat into energy. As a matter of fact, when we breathe in, and when we breathe out, we're breathing out this other gas called carbon dioxide. Now, luckily, trees need carbon dioxide to grow. Trees take carbon dioxide and sunlight and water and combine them and make food, food that we eat, corn and other things. Is that hot? It's pretty warm. Okay. Warm that should do it. I'm gonna. I'm going to heat this up for another, for a minute here. I'm just going to pop it in my microwave for uh, 45 seconds. And then we're going to put this in and watch it. In the meantime, I got a straw. This is just a little plastic straw. This is something you could do at home. And we're going to combine air and vibration to make sound. So I teach kids, lower school kids, uh, four and five year olds, how to do this. And sometimes they can't do it right away, but like any fine instrument, it takes a little practice and you have to learn how to do this. So I cut this into a, a V shape like that. And then let's check this, get the hot water out. Now it's just a little hotter. And I'm going to put this in here. Hopefully not spill it. So this is hot water. What do you think is happening to the air? Whoa, look at that. Why did it do that? It did it because this bottle, the air in the bottle, got hot. And remember, we were talking about how when the air gets hot, it takes up more space. Now, what do you think is going to happen if I let it cool for a few minutes? Well, if you said you think it's going to get smaller and block down again, you're exactly right. Now, we're going to go back to our straw. So I cut it like this. You can see what it looks like this way. And you can see what it looks like that way. And if you hold it right about here, and I'm going to put my lips on it here and move it back and forth and get just the right space, just the right place, you'll hear it make a sound. So you could make these at home and drive your mom and dad a little nuts with it. But it sounds a little like a moose, doesn't it? 
Now watch what happens. This is the air. So what's happening is the air is going through here and this is vibrating this. It's making this move back and forth quickly. Can I uh, zoom it in? To the sure. Let me show what it looks like. So I'm just going to show you. We can have a little fun with it. I can take it. And what do you think is going to happen if I cut this while it's making noise? Well, it's not going to be, the air is not going to be traveling through this tube as much. And so it's going to change the way it sounds. So listen, oh, look at what happened to our jar. The, it cooled off, the air shrank, and now the balloon fell down. Okay, so watch what happens now with this. <laughs> So you could try this at home too. Just cut the straw and be a little patient. It takes a little practice and you'll learn, you can too, you too can learn to be a, a, a straw musician because of air, because of the air vibrating these pieces. Let's see, we only have a few mi more minutes left I've got a question, Marty. Yes. <clears throat> How much air is there in the whole world? How much air is there in the whole world? Well, there's lots of air in the whole world. Air, let's see, the atmosphere goes up a few miles. Um, so we could do the math on it, <laughs> but let's just say there's an awful lot of air in the world. As a matter of fact, if you've seen planes fly through the air and you see those trails that they leave, those are trail called contrails and it stands for condensation. So condensation is when you have a gas, water as a gas, and it changes into a liquid. So when planes burn fuel, they produce lots of moisture and they're really high up in the sky and it's cold up there. That's why it's cold at Mount Hood and up in the mountains when it's warm here in the summer. The higher you go, the colder it gets. So it's really cold up there. And so what happens is just like in the winter time when you breathe out and you can see your breath, what you can see is the gas from the moisture, from the water that you're breathing out, changing into a liquid. And that's what these contrails are. Okay. Um, there's one other thing we can do quickly. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna do that here. Here's what I'm gonna show you instead. So this is something fun you can do. I just got this little cute sock. It's not one of my socks, but it's a children's sock. And I took this water bottle and I cut out the bottom of it. And now I'm gonna put this over the end, if I can. There we go. And now I'm going to take this and I'm going to dump this in here. And take this in here. We're just about, time is just about up. So this is just some, some soap that makes bubbles. So this is a fun thing you could do with the air also. So I'm gonna take this and dip this in here. So now this is wet. And when I blow, let's try that again. Yeah, 
down. Well, if you blow enough, you'll start to get little bubbles. Anyway, our time is up. I'd like to thank you for joining us today. I hope you had fun and learned something. If you have any questions, you can still send in your Q&A uh, button, and I'd be happy to answer them. So thanks for watching, and I wish you a good day. Thanks, Marty. <clears throat> we actually do have a couple questions. OK, I'll take them. OK, so why can't you feel air? Well, you can feel air. You can feel air when you're running. You can feel air blowing on your face. When it's windy, you can feel air pushing your hair and pushing your face. And sometimes the air is strong enough to push your body. Awesome. And why is there no air in space? Well, that's a good question. There's gravity, and gravity is the force that pulls everything down towards the center of the Earth. And that includes air. Gravity is pulling the air down and keeping the air closer to the Earth. Thanks. We have any more questions there, Remy? One more. Is air heavier than water? Well, here's water. Here's the air. It looks to me like the water sank down to the bottom and the air is on top. That means the water is heavier than the air. Okay? Okay. Well, I hope you had fun and learned something, and thanks. Bye for now. Thanks, Marty. And we encourage all of you, if you do these experiments at home, take some pictures and send them to us. We'd love to see them. And we will back, we'll be back for another class later this week.